It's now 6.30, so officially I would like to um, acknowledge the First Nations custodians across the country on the lands on which we are meeting. Josh and myself and a few of the other hosts are calling in from um, Wajak Noongar country, which is over in Perth, and I'm specifically calling in from Walyalup or Fremantle. I'd like to acknowledge that First Nations people are incredibly resilient and strong and that I'd like to pay respects to their elders past, present and future. It is now um, the season of Jilba over here, which means that it's warm days but cool nights and you get sporadic rain and sunshine and it's really coming into spring. Um, but for the season, um, the Noongar season, it is Jilba that we've just entered, which is exciting to see more sunshine. So um, tonight I'd like to introduce all of those um, that all of you that have just joined to Josh Byrne. He is a um, incredible, um, inspiring scientist, educator and um, researcher from that has a very long list of, um, of credits to him. So ultimately he's um, currently, he is best known for his role as a WA presenter on Gardening Australia but he's also got a really long history in applied research spanning water sensitive design, high performance housing and sustainable urban development. He's authored a lot of academic papers, holds a PhD and um, is also an adjunct, adjunct professor with the Research Centre for Water, Energy and Waste at the Harry Butler Institute, Murdoch University and he's a senior, senior research fellow at Curtin Uni's School of Design and the Built Environment. So Josh tonight is going to be talking to us about a personal project for him that is not just um, a research project, but it's actually his home that he's been sharing with his family for the past seven years in the leafy suburb of Hilton, just a stone's throw from my suburb here in Fremantle. Um, I was inspired tonight to invite Josh along because he um, was really Josh's house and his website really inspired us to build our sustainable house here. So that's why I invited him to do this webinar tonight. And if you're out there and you're logging in as a new member, um, there's an opportunity to get involved as a volunteer and help run webinars like this, um, or do any kind of great sustainable events in your local area. There's lots of different um, conveners from around the country that are calling in, and we have small branch groups that are supported by the national organisation. So if you're interested in getting involved further, I'd highly recommend you volunteer and get to know some really great people in your local area um, to help renew, spread the message of sustainable design. But look, without any uh, further um, um, <laughs> waiting, we'll actually hand over to Josh because he has a fabulous 40 minute presentation for you around his sustainable house, um, how it has been designed and what the performance has been over the last seven years. So without further ado, over to you, Josh. Thank you very much, Janita. And I just want to echo your acknowledgement of country. Uh, I'm also in Bali up in Fremantle because I'm working back in at our office in, in Fremantle and, and I live just nearby in Hilton, which of course is where the home that I'll share with you uh, tonight is. Um, so it's an interesting opportunity to sort of share what is both a, a very personal project in our family home, but also what became quite a high profile communications and subsequently a research project. And what I wanted to do tonight in response to the very kind invitation from Renew was to give you some key insights into the planning, design and construction of the home, as well as the performance results of what has been an extensive monitoring period. And also some of the changes that we made, particularly to the energy system of the home over the years, as we saw new technology emerge and trends in uh, fuel choice um, emerge during what has been a fairly short time. And I think that highlights just how dynamic the space is. And when I reflect back on the project, there are some principles that I'll share tonight that have been around forever. And that's essentially the, the principles of climate responsive design. They largely haven't changed. Uh, and a rock solid and the place is to start when you're looking at building a high performance home. 
but the technology, whether it be across energy and water, uh, is moving quickly. And I'll share some of the systems that we've been experimenting with and uh, that we have in operation in our home and, and that we also use in, in other projects that, that we work on. Uh, so to kick off, a little bit of context. So this is, I guess, a, a graphic of the two houses that we built and we, we call the project uh, Josh's house, uh, but really that's just a, a simple way of summarising the project. It's, it's not my house as such, it's my family home. In fact, our, the back house is our family home. I lived there with my partner Kelly and our, our two children. They were just really little when we first moved in. Uh, and the front house is my sister-in-law. So it really is a family project. And how we started this was that we were both, both families, mine and my sister-in-law's family, were at a point where we were ready to, to buy our own homes. Uh, we'd both been renting independently. And in fact, all of the homes and gardens that people may have seen me live in and fix up on Gardening Australia over the years were all rentals, which surprises a lot of people. Uh, but that was, that was the reality of, of, of where we were at as, as young people. And, and the fact that we didn't own a home didn't ever stop me from building gardens and what have you. So, but it got to a point where we had started a young family. We thought, no, we're ready to, to buy something. And uh, you know, my background as an environmental scientist and, and my partner, Kelly, is also an environmental scientist. And for us, it was just an obvious uh, choice to look at um, a home that performs well, that would be energy and water efficient. And uh, when we were looking around at options, we thought, you know, why don't we look at, at actually designing and building something and uh, having it as a, as a long-term option for us and doing it properly. And we were very lucky uh, to partner with, uh, with Griff Morris from Solar dwellings, he's probably known to, to many of you through the, the new circles. Uh, Griff is, is one of the most prolific and well-regarded solar passive design practitioners here in, in Perth. And I've been lucky to know Griff since I was a uni student and, uh, and used to go along to, to Griff's courses and, and, and he would um, also come and, and give guest lectures at, at, the, at the uni I was studying at in, in Perth at Murdoch Uni. And we became uh, good friends pretty early and we ended up doing projects together in, in a work sense. So when it came time to, to look at designing and building a home, Griff was the first person I went to, which has been great. And he was enormously generous in sharing his knowledge and expertise. And it was actually Griff who set me the challenge of making this um, a shared project and making it public. Uh, the early concept plans that, that Kelly and I had done and when we took it to Griff, uh, are very much um, present in, in the design you see today, but Griff's feedback was a bit of a reality check in that we were looking at using bespoke materials uh, and quite a sort of custom uh, design. And he said, why don't you think about using a volume builder approach, uh, using regular materials that are common in volume construction supply chains one, you'll be able to build it for the budget you've got. So that was the first reality check. But also it's a great opportunity to demonstrate that really you start with good design and that you can deliver high performance, cost effective homes uh, for a similar time frame and a similar budget as a typical um, house construction project you see in, in any market. That made a lot of sense to us. So, so that's what we decided to do. Uh, and um, the reason for... The two homes was that uh, when we're looking for a place, we, we were fortunate to find a large block of land uh, in an old suburb in, in Fremantle called Hilton. Uh, we were obviously scouting for a block with an east-west access, which is uh, um, access rather, which is ideal for building a, a cost effective climate responsive design building in, um, in our latitude, in fact, most of Southern Australia. And the block that we saw was ideal. It had a little timber frame, asbestos clad cottage on it, no trees of significance. So we really had a blank slate. And uh, the block originally was outside of our price point. It was too expensive to do on our own. So that's why we partnered with my sister-in-law. She was ready to build as well. And it ended up being the most magnificent outcome because uh, in addition to making it an affordable process, building two homes and sharing a block of land, it's been an enormously enriching process having family right next door. Uh, and when I, when I look at, you know, what are the great outcomes of this project for us, it's having that connection to family. Uh, and uh, and that, that's been a great outcome. But anyway, so that's a bit of, bit of the history. When we were looking at, 
um, sort of setting the, the sort of key principles and objectives of the design process, we had a couple of things that we, we were very clear on from the outset. Uh, the first one was that we wanted the homes to be uh, warm in winter and cool in summer. So, you know, climate responsive design, pretty common sense stuff. Uh, we wanted the homes to be uh, net zero in terms of their operation. So to be able to generate as much energy as they used on a, in a typical year. We wanted the homes to be highly water efficient. I'm a very keen gardener, it's probably no surprise. So I wanted plenty of room for gardening. So the homes would need to be compact. Uh, so we're not, not gobbling up all of the, the space on, on the block. Uh, but we also, um, and this is, this is really through conversations with Griff, um, wanted to have, make the homes um, designed to universal access principles. So the homes would be um, suitable to, to age in. Uh, and uh, even if we were to move on, uh, the homes are, uh, are highly usable by people with mobility challenges. And, and the more I looked into that, the more I began to realise this should just be common practice, as should many other sustainability principles that we will discuss tonight. Uh, also, common sense stuff, we wanted the, the homes to be you know, designed and built on healthy homes principles, so good indoor air quality. Uh, and there was the reality of having to do it on a, on a, on a fairly uh, modest budget in line with what you would normally see in the, in the volume market. So once we'd established all of that, we found the block. We said, okay, well, we're in a fairly unique position here, given I've got a media background uh, and, uh, and also um, uh, was working as a researcher as part of my, my work activities. We thought, here's a chance to make a very public challenge around um, putting this challenge out there that can we design and build a high performance, sustainable home for the similar time and uh, price as a, as a regular home? Uh, and can, can industry deliver that? And then we would document the whole process and then move into a performance monitoring phase to verify those results. And that's what I'll take you through tonight. Uh, I'll give you a very quick tour around the property on this graphic, just so as we take you through different slides, you, you'll know where we are. Uh, can you see my cursor rolling over the screen? Is that coming across? Wonderful, okay. So first thing is, north's up the page. You can see how the block is beautifully aligned on that east-west axis. And then the two homes also on that east-west axis. Uh, the front house was pushed towards the front of the block and this one to the back corner. Driveway is servicing the black block, uh, back block on the south. So we didn't take up a good north-facing outdoor space. Uh, it's a survey strata title, which essentially means that uh, the homes are independently owned, but there is uh, some common infrastructure, which I'll touch upon a little bit later. And both homes have their own private north-facing garden spaces, but we have the shared garden space in between, which is the vegetable garden. And essentially that means that we can really utilise that space. This is where we have our veggie beds, our chooks, our composting bins, a little nursery, a shed. Uh, but again, we have these private spaces. And you can see both homes are actually designed as 10 star and it's rated homes. Uh, they were uh, verified uh, on, um, on submission uh, of the uh, NetEdge rating. Um, CSIRO were doing their benchmarking exercise not long after we built these homes. And whenever you put in a claim of a 10 star home, CSIRO like to have a close look at it, make sure that it's all in order. Uh, and they certainly did and, and benchmarked our home, uh, re-reviewed it and recertified it as 10 star, which was terrific. I ended up uh, developing a wonderful working relationship with the NetHes team at CSIRO and still work with them, uh, with them today on research projects. So that's been great. Uh, but I, I will say that I'm not going to bang on about the 10 star thing so much. We reached for 10 stars because it was, a, it was an aspiration and we were able to achieve, achieve it in a, in a relatively mild climate like Perth with an ideal block. Uh, and uh, we executed a simple design that enabled us to do that with, with Griff's technical guidance. You know, what we typically say, if you're, if you're pushing above seven and a half stars, you're into the realm of a high performance home and that's great. But Josh's 10 star house had a much better ring to it as we moved into this communications campaign. So that's what we pushed for. Uh, the homes uh, are also uh, green smart, 
um, homes in accordance with the HIA uh, Green Smart protocols. And we did that as a way of wanting to use an industry recognized benchmark that the volume industry understood. Uh, of course, we had our own bespoke sustainability framework that we use when we design any project, but we align that with the Green Smart uh, protocols. So both homes uh, were certified as Green Smart uh, homes. Uh, so just very quickly before I go into um, some of the design principles and construction process, you can see with the two homes uh, here, uh, the house with the roof off uh, in winter with the north facing windows and sun pouring in. And then this is what the homes look like in summer, clearly roof on, uh, shade sails and deciduous trees. So shaded in summer and, and nice and light and open uh, in winter for sun to, sun to pour in. Okay, so let's get underway with some of the design principles. So firstly, um, you know, responding to the block and the orientation, uh, and I'll just focus here on, this is the, the rear house, our home. You can see with the home orientated on the east-west axis there, uh, the main windows all uh, to the north for that low angle window solar gain. Uh, the home uh, is only two rooms deep and the, the windows and doors are lined in such a way where we can get cross ventilation through for summer cooling. But essentially it's about really maximizing that window solar gain to warm the home and then excluding summer sun to keep it nice and cool inside and then that heat purging and nighttime charging with cool to keep the home comfortable uh, in, uh, in summer. So really well established principles, not rocket science, some basic building physics, uh, understanding your site, understanding your climate type, uh, and then as you start to move through the design process, uh, using uh, you know, NetHairs, um, uh, certified uh, software tools to really fine tune the design to get the performance you want. So we look at shading devices here, these little cross sections uh, on the right hand side of the screen. You can see uh, in summer uh, here, this is that little point where the, um, where that, uh, so that's where that elevation is here. So we have deciduous trees on the north in summer, so it's all shaded with the canopy and in winter low ankle sun pouring inside the home. And then this little section here is on this part of the house. We've gone for shade sales here. So we have complete control of where we want summer shade and winter light. We also have grapevines growing up pergola and then a winter light coming in. Really simple, practical, cost-effective ways to heat and, uh, and cool uh, your home. Okay, so in terms of material, so this is the that northern elevation. Uh, so you can see there it's a slab on ground construction. So it's a, it's earth coupled slab, which is perfect for Perth. Uh, no under slab insulation necessary. In fact, that earth coupling is really good to maintain a nice consistent temperature uh, year round. Uh, and then uh, we've gone for um, brick as the main construction, particularly for all the internal mass. Uh, we have timber frame uh, insulated and cladded walls on the south side and uh, reverse brick veneer on the east and west side, but really for all the mass walls internally, it's brick, a very cost-effective source of mass. So between the wall mass and the floor mass that's earth coupled, really, really stable. And so it's that orientation shading systems and the window placement that allows you to have that control over the heating and cooling through the opening and closing of, of, uh, of curtains and windows. So then we look at insulation uh, to really uh, keep that heat out in summer and warmth in, in winter. Uh, so uh, in the limited areas where we had uh, double brick, and really that was only around the window framing on the north, where it was the most simple and cost-effective way to do it, because most of the north was glazing. Uh, it was just a cavity brick with a reflective closed cell insulation, so yeah, pretty stock standard stuff for Perth. Uh, but the, the main walling insulation was on um, the east and western walls, which is where we chose to have reverse brick veneer. So we had a, a, um, a leaf of brickwork on the inside for the mass. And then we had a timber frame clad wall externally. And then in the inside, we could put in bulk insulation and reflective insulation and of course, um, uh, membranes. Uh, and really what that was about was to um, provide that internal thermal mass, but separate um, the hot afternoon, morning and afternoon sun that normally hits those eastern and western elevations from getting that sun inside the home. 
Then on the southern side, where it's all bedrooms, uh, given that all the um, living areas were zoned on the north, uh, as, as one does to make sure you've got the, the, the best climate responsive design for that warm space uh, during winter where all the sun is. Um, the southern wall was just timber frame, uh, clad and, and, and insulated. So then we look at the, uh, the roofing. So we went firstly for a, a light color, lightweight roof. Um, so that's just a color bond surf mist. And of course the, the color choice is so solar radiation is reflected rather than absorbed becoming heat. And the lightweight is so it cools down very quickly. Uh, and then under that we had Andy Connor's insulation. And then in the uh, ceiling, uh, we've just used uh, bulk insulation, uh, and that's uh, R4.5 rated bats, um, which are uh, ideal for Perth. And this is the other point I'll make is that we didn't over-specify insulation. We just understood what was needed. And again, guided by uh, the Burst Pro modeling, with Burst Pro was a software that was used as part of the NATAS assessment. Um, and, you know, working uh, through that to make sure that the the insulation that was chosen for the walls, for the ceiling, for the roof. Uh, and again, when we look at glazing, the right glazing type, really understanding what the modeling was suggesting. So we weren't over specified because it's about delivering this on budget, uh, understanding the climate type and responding to the way that you were designing the home. It's the best way to do it cost effectively. So when it came to windows, many people were surprised that we got such a high rating uh, without using extensive double glazing. And we do have one panel of double glazing in the home. It's actually above the kitchen sink on the, on the southern side of our open plan living dining kitchen. Uh, but we were able to actually just get away with using uh, high performance low E glazing uh, on uh, the rest of the windows uh, when used in conjunction with permitted insulating curtains. Um, so uh, the reason for the, uh, the double glazing above the kitchen sink is that we it wasn't practical to use to use drapes over over the sink, so that's that's why we use double glazing there. Um, and uh, you can see it's a very neat permitting detail there. It's a it's a hidden permit, and of course it's the permit and the double layered insulating drapes that trap the air and essentially insulate those windows of a night time when they're closed. So a really simple operation uh, in winter and night time they're closed. The, the layers are trapped air, uh, keep the warmth in and the cold out. And then in the morning when the sun's up, we open uh, those drapes and uh, sun pours in, warms up the slab, warms up the walls and, and walking around on that concrete floor. So all we've done is a, was a simple uh, honing and the use of a low VOC water-based uh, paint over the slab. It's the, kind of the cheapest finish that we could, we could find that looked half decent and that we wouldn't be precious about with a couple of young kids who were keen to ride around on that floor with their scooters and, and everything else. Uh, but you walk around on that floor barefoot in winter and it feels like you've got underslap heat. It's so effective. Uh, but, uh, but really, um, that's how we, we set about making sure that the glazing would perform as we need. Let's move on to landscaping. And it's often one of the most um, undercooked responses to a building design when we're looking at, at climate responsive design. Uh, landscaping is a key step in the process to really complement the thermal performance of a home. So uh, this is the home just after completion in 2013. Uh, it's a clear, fine Perth day in July. And you can see, again, that northern elevation, uh, the shade sails are off, the shade sails fixed to that uh, pergola structure. And the home and all those northern windows are bathed in sunshine uh, and uh, plenty of light getting in. And then this is that same elevation in summer, uh, taken just last summer. So shade sails up, uh, now grapevines established over the pergola, the deciduous trees that wrap around the northern part of the garden, small trees like crepe myrtles, uh, productive deciduous trees like pomegranate, the quince, and also some lovely big shade trees like uh, grudinsins, provide that beautiful summer shade. And they've all been chosen because they're deciduous trees that canopy up beautifully. They're mainly small to medium trees, but they all lose their leaves nice and early in winter and let all of that sunlight in. And you can see also there the use of um, some turf uh, around uh, the home. It's a nice cooling surface. We've used a timber deck because uh, it retains less heat than, say, paving. 
So it's what I would call a, a climate responsive landscape design and it's cooling and it's shady and it works in conjunction with the, uh, the building fabric to make a really comfortable home. And this is what it looks like inside in summer. So that's the middle of the day or probably late in the afternoon, you know, shadows, we can open the windows up as soon as the sea breeze is in and it's getting cool and the house is shaded. We don't have any unwanted solar gain coming in. It's very, very comfortable. Uh, and uh, I'll talk more a little bit about the landscaping um, a bit later in the presentation. Uh, but here you can see just um, how important that connection uh, between the inside and the outside are. Uh, you know, we have designed, it, it looks bigger than it is. It's not, not a particularly big garden area. And often I see, um, you know, people struggle with the design of a garden space on the northern side of the home or the southern side of the fence, particularly when that area is not particularly big. And so we just tried a few little, or I should say executed a few little strategies like extending the deck, having a set down to the lawn, having a step up again to a, a um, uh, some, some retaining around the perimeter various height plantings and you can very quickly screen your neighbours and create your own little oasis. Okay, so let's talk about the electrical fit out now. So you can see we've established a, a high performance home based on uh, the design of the building uh, and the um, supporting uh, landscaping. We actually had three stages of, of electrical system for want of a, a way to describe it. And I'll, I'll take you through that just briefly. Um, now the home is completely electric, running off solar. Uh, when we uh, designed the home in 2012 to have it built in in 2013, we moved in in, um, in mid 2013. The the kind of low carbon, uh, high performance home thinking of the day in the in the volume market was to um, have a dual fuel home uh, with. Uh, natural gas providing the cooktop fuel and also a boost of the solar hot water system. Uh, when you're looking at it, what was the accessible technology and accessible price points for the volume market? And, uh, you know, a, a typical PV system size was two and a half to three kilowatts in terms of, you know, demonstrating a payback within, within sort of five to six years. So that's what we went with. Um, and we slightly oversized our PV system to be able to um, offset the carbon emissions from the limited amount of natural gas use that would be would be used for, for the stove top and, and the gas booster. And the gas booster was obviously used for winter. So solar hot water system with a gas booster and gas cooktop. top, um, everything else was electric. It was a three kilowatt PV system, uh, as in the panels or the array and a 2.5 kilowatt inverter. Uh, then, and at that point in, in 2013, um, home batteries were not even on the horizon as being anywhere near me listed. But it was only a couple of years later that one of my colleagues, um, uh, Dr. Gemma Green, who was doing a PhD at the time with the research group that I was working for at Curtin University, uh, she was beginning to explore the use of, of batteries as part of the sort of energy disruption. And we ended up choosing my place for the deployment of what became the first grid connected uh, lithium ion phosphate battery on the Southwest interconnected system. Uh, it was a hell of a job getting it approved through Western Power and installed. Uh, and then we went through a monitoring period to understand um, how uh, a battery, and at the time it was a, it was a, a battery by BYD, a, a 10 uh, kilowatt hour storage, nine kVA unit, um, how, how such a battery could help increase the the utilisation of on-site generated power. So we had that for a period, but we still had the dual fuel gas for the solar hot water uh, system booster and for the cooktop. What we found a couple of years later, and we we're collecting data all through this period, and I'm telling you the story so I can show you the data at the end. Uh, within a couple of years, what we saw in the market, and this was becoming evident as I was um, working on research projects around the country, um, like once again, through Curtin, uh, and uh, in partnership with the CRC for Low Carbon Living, working with volume builders in other cities, in other states around the country to see how we can start to look at similar concepts in their, in their regions. Um, we were seeing that uh, induction cooktops, which are highly efficient and electric clearly, uh, as well as air source heat pump hot water systems were becoming much more cost effective and certainly in the case of inductions were becoming mainstream offerings. So we said the, the idea of the all electric home 
that was actually paired up with um, a suitably sized PV system to make a net zero is now, at that point, arguably mainstream, now very much mainstream and achievable. So we bit the bullet and actually swapped out um, those uh, gas fuel um, run appliances and went all electric. And we did this about two years ago. So that included um, getting rid of the old solar hot water system and we ended up finding another, um, another home for that. None of it was wasted. And same with the, with, um, uh, the, the cooktop. And we put in a, an air source heat pump. Uh, we also put in an induction stove. And at that point, we could disconnect from gas and actually had ATCO come and remove the meter and cap it at the mains, which is extremely satisfying. Because there's, there's one thing for certain, we're at a point now where there's no need to articulate gas uh, to homes, and, and that's been demonstrated all around the country, including heating-dominated climates like Canberra. There's local leaders doing that and demonstrating that the reality of an all-electric home that can be net zero uh, is has arrived. So all the other common sense stuff like efficient lighting using um, LEDs um, in the in the living spaces, or we use compact, compact fluoros because they were cheaper at the time in things like hallways uh, and and the laundry. Um, they were cost effective and they were there back in 2013 and just as they are now. So that, that kind of locked in. One thing we did do from a design perspective, though, is we really tried to naturally daylight the home. And this was as much for just well-being as it is for, for energy efficiency, not having to run lights during the day. So we incorporated uh, two um, solar tubes. So this one here you can see on the left-hand side is um, the solar tube down the end of the hallway. Uh, we went for a solid door. Uh, rather than the glass pane door there because you can actually see right down the driveway and onto the street. And we, we didn't want that view back into our home for privacy. Uh, so we uh, had a solid door but put in a, in a solar tube and we have another one in the walk-in row. But other than that, the home is beautifully uh, daily uh, during the day and no need for lighting. Then, of course, efficient appliances. So whilst we have no mechanical heating and cooling, uh, because of um, the home being designed so so comfortably. Uh, we do have ceiling fans, which are, are great in summer for those um, those odd days in Perth where the sea breeze doesn't in fact come in. Um, and, and that happens uh, you know, for a few weeks a year and the ceiling fans make all the difference just to cool the, the body down or give you that, that sense of perceived cooling. And then of course, sensible choices and appliances. Nothing um, crazy uh, and all things that have good, good price points and good payback periods. So uh, we then look at solar and, and PV. Uh, so I mentioned originally we had the three kilowatt um, PV array and 2.5 kilowatt inverter, uh, and then added the 10 kilowatt hour 9 kVA battery. Um, when we did the upgrade to the electrical appliances, the other thing that we noticed that was happening was the, um, the pending arrival of uh, electric vehicles and the reality that most people will charge these at home. So what we wanted to understand as part of our research was, well, you know, what's the impact of home charging on, uh, on a home with PV and batteries and how can you optimise that charging time to try and work within uh, real-time generated power to, to charge the home and, and not just rely on charging off peak. Uh, so as part of that, we uh, remodeled uh, the load and um, upsized uh, the PV system to 6.6 uh, .6 kilowatt PV array and a five kilowatt inverter. We also replaced the old BYD battery with the new LG Chem Res U10. The reason for that's really interesting is because this one doesn't have a, uh, a trip point, whereas the BYD one, which at the time was the only battery on the market that Western Power would approve, uh, it, it met all the necessary compliances. Uh, this is before the half dozen of batteries are on the market now. Um, it had a nine kVA trip point. So as soon as you know, the draw was over nine kilowatt, uh, which can quickly happen when you're charging a car and cooking something uh, on high on your induction, it would trip the whole power system out. So these were, were real learnings that were coming about as we're looking at the integration of these technologies. Um, and uh, so that was the reason why we up, upgraded the battery. Uh, the other thing we found was that the BYD battery had a very high parasitic load. Its onboard energy management system uh, was drawing about two kilowatt hours a day, uh, making it the highest energy usage appliance on my home network, which is, which is kind of you know ironic in a way. Uh, it was using more, more energy than the fridge was, 
uh, whereas this new battery, uh, which is uh, DC coupled to the inverter, um, doesn't have a parasitic load. So there's the EV charging. We we're fortunate to have the loan of a little Mitsubishi IMEV, the cutest little EV ever made, one of the original uh, mass market ones. We had that for 14 months, a bit of time for commissioning, and then a 12 month period of, um, of running the car, uh, charging it and, and understanding its impact uh, on, on energy use at home. So we'll move into water now. I'll come back to some of the performance data at the end of the presentation. Um, the approach to water was not dissimilar to uh, how I took you through um, our design approach with, with energy systems and appliances. And at first we start with efficiency. So the obvious place to start is indoors. So, you know, um, water efficient fixtures like showers, which is the biggest indoor water user, uh, followed by toilet. Uh, so there we have the, uh, the Coroma Flow 6.5 litre a minute and um, the uh, Coroma Integrated Hand Basin a Five Star Toilet. Uh, we then look at um, non-drinking water sources that can reduce uh, the strain on Maine's water supply, and that's particularly important in Perth, uh, where it's well known, of uh, regional dry and climate. Uh, the fact now that we have nearly 50% of Perth's water supply being seawater desalination, which is a very high energy intensity source of water, uh, with most of the energy source that is used to produce that water being gas, which is kind of a Again, a, a bit of an irony in that we're burning fossil fuels to produce water at a high energy rate, which we then use. Uh, and of course, it's the dry climate as a result of burning of fossil fuels that means we need to use more diesel. So it is this kind of weird perverse cycle. So I'm, I'm a big advocate for understanding how we can look at using lower energy sources of water. And, and that really starts with you know, the basics of water sensitive urban design, understanding what local water sources are available, and then integrating those uh, within. Um, a project site, whether it be at lot scale or whether it be a cluster or, or precinct or district. So here at the household scale, really simple stuff. Rainwater harvesting, so we collect water off the whole roof at um, 200 square uh, metres. Um, all of the standard components of um, rain heads with, um, with leaf strains, uh, first flush devices, and then we have a 20 kilolitre tank. Uh, that's actually used to provide water for the entire house. It goes through a basic two-stage filtration and UV disinfection, so it meets Australian drinking water standards. Uh, and then we have sized that up. It provides our water for about eight months of the year. Um, Perth has a long, dry summer, so to actually store enough water to get you through the rest of uh, summer would mean um, tripling the size of the tank, which becomes sort of impractical space and cost-wise. So it's really about size and that infrastructure to get your best bang for buck for the period that's raining, giving you really good reliability of supply for your end uses, whether that be just toilet and washing machine, like many might used to use it for, or in our case, being enthusiastic the whole home. We then collect uh, the, the wastewater, um, or at least the grey water fraction. So water from the shower and bath, uh, from the hand basins, from the laundry, and run it through a very simple uh, direct diversion uh, grey water um, system. Uh, you can see the plumbing there. So when we designed the home, we specified all the plumbing. So the branch drains from the, um, uh, the sources of grey water were separate to the branch drains from the toilet and kitchen. So black water and grey water se were separated. And obviously with the slab on ground construction, it's critical that's done at the time of, of building. Um, and, uh, and then that runs through a, a simple two-stage filtration. There's a sump pump that pumps it out to lilac drip line that goes out to the garden. I'll talk more about um, hydro zoning and how we, how we uh, have integrated that into the landscape. Uh, but that then provides a restriction-free source of water uh, for parts of the garden that are suited to, to grey water. It obviously means we have to be mindful about the detergents we use. Uh, we switch the system off over winter to allow the soil to rest. Uh, and there's a little bit of uh, pH management because even the, the garden friendly detergents are still alkaline. We then look at stormwater. And again, this is really, you can see here, blurring balance between the building and the landscape. We look at take a whole of site um, approach. Um, and often it's the water and it's the landscaping that links the two. Uh, so we've designed the whole property as a sponge. There's other than the concrete, you can see there at the driveway crossover, which is a council requirement. Once you're onto our property, all the surface treatments are permeable. Uh, so the driveway is gravel over the drainage cell. So all the rain when it hits the ground becomes stormwater, infiltrates to recharge soil moisture and eventually recharge the aquifer. 
Uh, we then have a shared ball, which is the, the main piece of shared infrastructure between the two gardens. So in Perth, we are on a, a coastal plain and we have what's known as the superficial aquifer, where we are, it's about 20 metres beneath the surface to recharge through annual rainfall and infiltration. And we see that as a large tank. So we've done the water balance, so we understand what infiltrates from our property based on um, the size and what's taken out through rainwater use uh, and the infiltration coefficients based on our surface treatments. Uh, we then take that water up via a bore, we meter that so we can make sure we're working within our sustainable abstraction rates. And that's used for parts of the garden that aren't suited to, um, to grey water or where the grey water is insufficient. And how we work that out is quite simply through hot landscape hydrazine. So this is a process where you design your landscape. You, you look at um, grouping plants based together on their common water needs. So turf has a different water requirement to um, vegetable crops or fruit trees or native gardens, which once established shouldn't need uh, watering if they're uh, local plants. Um, and then it's about matching the right water source to the right crop type. So you can see on this landscape plan, um, the purple are the areas that are irrigated by grey water, and so we've got plants suited to grey water. We avoid vegetables in that area, um, the deeper rooted plants that can take some of the, the um, spasmodic watering cycles of grey water, depending on occupancy and so forth, plants that can take the alkalinity, particularly over summer where there's no rain to flush. Um, you can see the, the, the larger zones are natives for establishment, bit of watering, but after that on their own. Uh, and uh, we tailor each of those hydro zones with the right irrigation emitters so we can irrigate very efficiently. So a quick walk through those hydro zones. So this is the, um, the, the street elevation um, of the front house, which is my sister-in-law's house, but we kind of treat the whole property as a whole. I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to look after the garden for the whole site, so I get lots of areas to play in and, and film in. So being a, an eastern elevation here, we've gone for evergreen foliage, so um, medium-sized eucalypts, uh, which you can see in the morning, they're completely shaded at eastern elevation. Uh, there are awnings there in the verandas and the window awnings, uh, and also narrow windows to reduce exposure from, from um, solar gain in, in summer, but then complemented by those uh, natural shading systems. Uh, so uh, all local regional native plants are well suited to Perth soils and provide habitat and design there so there's still a good presence to the street, good line of sight, all that sensible stuff. Uh, the veggie garden in between is the high water use zone uh, where we grow vegetables. This is irrigated from the bore because the grey water is not suitable for vegetables. So we grow root crops and all sorts of things that we have high contact with. We grow a fair amount of our own um, vegetables. We also grow a lot of fruit trees. There's some 25 odd varieties of fruit tree and vine. You can see in the back there against the the western wall of Lisa's um, house, there's a beautiful trellis plum. Uh, you know, and again, where we've got these exposed walls that would normally, you know, get sun, and that is a reverse brick veneer wall as well. So there's brick on the inside, insulation, and lightweight cladding, uh, but it also provides a great spot to trellis a fruit tree uh, that also provides additional shading and insulation, if you like, during summer to that wall. Um, and all sorts, it's an organic garden, of course, so lots of companion plants around the outside. And this is um, our, um, our back garden. It's actually the front of our home because, you know, we, we see the front of the home as part of the house that faces north where you zone all your living areas. Uh, and you can see there, you know, the deck area, the house nice and shaded, a bit of lawn for cooling and, and all the trees. It's a lovely place to live. Uh, we even made the move and went to an electric barbecue. We found that, that Weber do an electric barbecue. So that was the last appliance to come off the gas. Uh, and we do a lot of our cooking out there. And that means that you take the heat outside too. So, you know, the performance of the home is, is also about how you operate it, opening and closing those blinds and windows throughout the seasons, as I touched on earlier, and taking the heat outside when you cook in summer. Pretty common sense stuff, really. So to kind of wrap up um, uh, with a few slides, I wanted to share some of the performance with you before we throw it open to questions. I'm, I'm sure there'll be a few. Uh, as I mentioned, we were very lucky um, early in the project to... Uh, develop um, research partnerships. Uh, and that was principally through a research fellowship that I was appointed to uh, through Curtin University, uh, through uh, the Curtin University Sustainability Policy Institute, CUSP, within the School of uh, um, Design and the Built Environment, uh, with research funding through the Cooperative Research Centre for Low Carbon Living, which was and still has been the main research uh, hub for research into decarbonising the built environment. And 
I was lucky enough to, to have research projects run over about seven years. Um, this started as the first one, as one of the CRC's living labs, where we were testing um, the design, we were testing the different technologies, some of that I've touched upon with you, uh, tracking that sort of home energy um, system uh, transition uh, from dual fuel to, uh, to all electric, uh, but also used as a way to really excite the market. So we were collecting data, we had some 70 channels of data acquisition up and running, all locally data logged. Uh, everything from you know, the temperature of, um, of the various rooms and building fabric from slab, wall, ceiling, roof cavity, roof surface to really understand how the sort of um, thermal performance of the fabric was going, but also understanding um, water use, uh, the energy use of all of the pumps, all of the other circuits as well. So we could do a really, really detailed analysis of, of how the design performed. And then this all became an open source database that was shared with other researchers uh, all around Australia. And we had a number of those channels live on the website as an engagement tool so people could jump on and see how the house was going. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, we've translated that data into a number of academic publications uh, and uh, you know, from papers and, and books and, and technical guides. Uh, so I'm pleased to say that, that really I think it's the data and the learnings from it which may well be the longest legacy from this project. Uh, but uh, it was also the, the community engagement and communications was a big part of it too. So we did a video series that documented the whole design, build and operation of the home. We have fact sheets on all the initiatives. We have a virtual tour. Uh, and all of that is still live on the Josh's House website. I'll give you that link at the end. Uh, that's all open source. All of our plans, the building plans, the landscaping plans, uh, all of the service drawings for all the water systems are all open source and can all be accessed via the website. And this was really made possible um, through the industry partnerships that we had and, and also through, through the research partnerships. So some data, how did it perform? Um, this is a plot of daily temperature at midday inside the home in the living area versus um, outside. We had an on-site weather station, obviously. Um, and you can see the blue line is the inside. You can see that over summer uh, and then down into winter and back into spring and summer again. Um, it's sitting pretty comfortably between the sort of high teens and, and low twenties for most of the year. There's a few weeks where we would see dipping down um, beneath 18 only on a few occasions and, and a few occasions where it got above 25 degrees, but that was rare. Uh, and when you look at the outside temperatures, which were, you know, hitting 40 in summer and, and in winter getting down, you know, to 10, keeping in mind, this is at, this is at midday. And we did that really just to sort of show, that's, you know, uh, at a main time, the middle of the day for an easy reference point. Um, we also, of course, you know, plotted data um, throughout uh, the course of, of the day and night time and what we would find is that the house got its coolest it ever got has been about 16 degrees uh, middle of winter um, just before sun up after several days of cloudy temperature so we're not sort of recharging the heat in the in the floor mass uh, there still is that earth coupling and, and and stability there but it, it started to get a bit cool it would normally get up to about 20 21 even in the coolest part of the day but normally on a winter stay typical period the house is, you know, sitting anywhere between 20 and, and, and 22 degrees. Uh, the hottest that the inside area has ever got is 28.5 uh, after um, a period of the, the doldrums, I guess you'd call it in Perth, where we had this really, really hot, humid period and no, no um, uh, uh, temperature drop at night time. So we were, not, night time temperatures were sitting in the, in the low 20s still. Uh, the design does rely on um, on nighttime cooling uh, to, to, uh, to keep it cool uh, with that diurnal swing. And typically in Perth, you get that other than these, these strange events where it drops out. So, so thermally, I'd say it's very successful. The energy use and emissions, um, let me just take you through this chart very quickly. This, this sets out those three stages that I mentioned. Uh, so here, this is stage one where we um, originally uh, designed and built the home. Uh, where there was uh, the dual fuels, uh, so gas supply, you can see that represented there in the energy source, uh, and also we had the, um, the smaller PV system, no battery. So here we have our uh, load profile, 
Um, and then we can see um, the sources of energy. So this is what was generated and used in real time from solar. Uh, this is what we would use from the grid. Uh, because not surprisingly, in such an efficient home, and like most families were either at school or working during the day, so some daytime use, and we would do all the sensible things like you know set dishwashers and washing machines to run during the day to optimise available power. But we would still get home at the night time uh, and cook, you know, uh, run the oven, uh, and you know have lights and appliances on. So, um, and what we found though, as we um, had hoped, was that we were comfortably offsetting all of our operational um, energy use, making it a, a net zero home. Uh, this next area, what we call stage two, is where we introduced the uh, battery, the first battery. So same uh, energy mix, same PV size system. Um, and you can see it's quite interesting here. The, you know, this is the, the self-supply in solar. This is the self-supply in stored energy from our battery. So the amount of grid import has gone down. Uh, but likewise, um, our amount of export has gone down because we're consuming it to charge the battery and use it at night time, uh, but as well as uh, losing some through the parasitic load, which is really interesting. Uh, that certainly wasn't in the brochure of the battery uh, and something that the manufacturer wasn't really too keen to, uh, to talk about. Um, but anyway, it's all part and parcel of testing these things. It was an early model. It's no longer, um, no longer produced. Uh, but again, operating at net zero, but the satisfying thing here is a much higher degree of um, self-supply. And then into what we are in now, stage three, all electric. So you can see that the gas has disappeared from the fuel mix, it's now all electric. Um, and the other thing you can see here, our load has increased uh, somewhat because this, well, I wanted to show you was the period of um, energy use where we were running the car. So uh, you can see here, the electric vehicle, um, the cursor is still running over there. So that includes, this is the amount of energy used over the course of the year to charge the car. What I should also point out is this also shows all the energy used to um, provide uh, the rainwater that's pumping UV, the grey water and ball pump. So we're, we're capturing all of our energy use here. The interesting thing is, is that we're just offsetting um, our uh, small amount of uh, grid energy use. And, and that was mainly when we ended up charging the car at night time. What we find without the car charging, um, that the uh, 10 kilowatt hour uh, battery, which actually, because we've got it, it's set at a 20% cutoff. So it's actually really, really only eight kilowatt hours of accessible um, uh, power. Uh, we um, find that, that that's adequate to run the home on a typical day in a, in a typical week in a typical year. Uh, it's only when we might have, again, several really cloudy days, the battery might not fully charge up, especially if we're doing things like, um, you know, running lots of appliances inside. Uh, but uh, typically we wouldn't rely on the grid. We're certainly exporting um, a lot more than we would ever take back. Um, but, and we would try and charge the car on the weekend during the day. Uh, charging in the afternoon when we'd otherwise just be exporting to the grid. So it's a great way to kind of help self-moderate, uh, you know, um, surplus export. Uh, ideally, one day that'll be automated and we'll have a much smarter grid than we do now. Obviously, lots of work happening in that space. Uh, and EVs will be part of the grid stabilisation story. Uh, but uh, we, we're certainly generating um, a lot of surplus power. Uh, we size that system with the expectation that we'd have two cars charging. And we want to offset the transport for those two cars, but um, we're a one car house and we'll probably stay that way, to be honest. So um, let's look at uh, now annual energy use uh, by load compared to uh, typical Perth house. So um, we're using, including with the, that period with the car charging, around about 15 units or 15 kilowatt hours a day compared to the local average uh, of uh, 20, uh, which includes. Um, uh, gas use. Um, but what's interesting is our load profile includes the charging of the car, so we're bringing around, bringing personal uh, transport in there, and it also includes supplying all of our own, 90 percent of our own water through rainwater, um, uh, grey water and ball water, and of course that's not factored into the typical Perth house. So um, without those additional loads, the, the operation of the house is about 50 percent more efficient than a typical house. Uh, and even when we bring in the supply and treatment of most of our own water and charging of a car, 
uh, we're still about you know, nearly 25% under the typical average. So, and it's all either produced or offset by renewables. So this stuff's not hard. The numbers do stack up as far as the energy balance goes. Uh, and in many cases, um, other would potentially the cost of batteries at the moment, the business case is just about there too. Um, and certainly uh, one of the biggest uh, payback periods that we demonstrated was, was um, around charging the car at home and petrol savings compared to a, um, an ICE um, car equivalent. The main savings really not having the HVAC, so having a high performance home, obviously air conditioning or, um, or other um, mechanical heating and cooling is the, the biggest energy user in a home. So look, just wrapping up now, so we still have time for questions. I couldn't help but share the water story as well. Um, the integration of different um, large scale water technologies to sustain sustainable landscapes was actually the topic of my PhD. So um, the water systems that we, we set up um, at our house were the kind of culmination of all things that I've been testing on several earlier case studies that I've designed and built over the years. One of the benefits of doing a very long winded part-time PhD over 10 plus years, which you get plenty of time to practice and on the applied field work. But the water systems have been a real success at our place. And, and uh, you can see here with the water use at our place, we've had a 90% reduction on mains water use compared to a, a typical um, Perth house uh, with uh, most of that substitution coming through the rainwater for inside and then the uh, bore water for outside. And there's the con uh, contribution of, of the grey water use. But what's interesting, you compare it to the Perth average of the ball. It's worth flagging that one in, one in four homes in Perth uh, have a ball because of the, the, the nature of our geology and, and hydrology. Uh, it's typically grossly overused. Uh, and, and I'd like to, to suggest that if you look at the quality of our garden, um, how, how well it works in terms of its contribution to food and habitat and shading, its, its functional uses, um, through good design, through good irrigation management, through the right technology, you can have a beautiful productive garden, even in a place like Perth, uh, with a very responsible amount of water use, which is well beneath the recharge rate of what we modelled for, um, uh, for groundwater infiltration. So we call that a, a, a sustainable groundwater story. To wrap up, if you want any more information on the project, as I said, we have this website, joshshouse.com.au. All the information there is open source. Uh, all we request is that you acknowledge the source if you want to use it. You can share the plans, you can adapt and build from the plans. I want to do a big shout out to Griff Morris and Solar Dwellings again. Um, as our design partner, one of the really generous things Griff did was agree from the outset, in fact, insist on the fact that he wanted to make the designs open source. So well done to Griff. Um, and uh, and we, we really are are keen for that to be utilised. Um, we still maintain the website. All of my CRC research um, is, now, is now wrapped up. Um, the CRC for Low Carbon Living, uh, Carbon Living has finished its, its planned life and, and closed a couple of years ago. Um, I, I still fund the operation of the website through, through my practice as a kind of a pro bono contribution to making sure the information is still available. Uh, we'll do that for at least the next year or two until something supersedes it. Um, you know, I'm hoping someone else will come along and do something similar. And there's loads of other good information out there, but we're still finding there's lots of interest in this. We're still finding we're getting a lot of traffic. Uh, and so long as the resources are still considered useful and still um, valid, uh, we'll, we'll continue to make those uh, available. Um, we do have the virtual tour, which was a, a great way to respond to the fact that we're getting lots of inquiries for tours. When we first um, opened the home, we had many, many thousands of people through. Um, that started to get a bit, um, a bit demanding on the family, being a family home. So we don't do the tours anymore, but we did film uh, a, um, a virtual tour using Matterport technology. So you can have a look through every room and every nook and cranny in the house and garden. And then there's links within that tour to all the resources, whether it be fact sheets or data sets or videos. So we've tried to make it as accessible and interesting as possible. And then of course, the, the last and probably, um, uh, although I should say the most, the most recent, probably last major comms output for the project has been uh, the Sustainable House Handbook, which I uh, authored and published by Hardy Grant that came out late last year. Uh, that really is the capturing of the overall story of the garden. We share all the data in that too, and uh, you'll find that at most libraries and, and most bookshops. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. That was epic.
um, full hour of info for everyone. So um, really good to hear around the design and then exactly how it performed as well, and including some of those surprises and um, how you transitioned from gas to electric and then what the profiles were. Um, I found that very interesting myself. Now we do have a lot of questions. Um, we were, um, we are, I think we're gonna actually go till 8 p.m. Half an hour of questions, if that's okay with you, Josh. Totally fine with me. Excellent, because we got quite a few and we've actually got 30 questions that have come through. Wow, that's um, great. There's, yeah, there's quite a few comments and lots of great comments in the chat. So feel free to check them out. But we might start off with, um, um, with actually the, the life cycle of your um your property so can you um the life cycle of your material there's a question yes. from Callie about that so did yeah. you ever um did you gain a holistic understanding of your carbon footprint through this project yep so great question and yes we did um something that we were very mindful of from the outset so uh we engaged etool uh, who many of you would be aware of they're a leading um, Perth-based uh, life cycle analysis company, and they've developed their own tool, um, eTool. Uh, and we worked with them during the design phase to test some variations of, of materials. Uh, when we first um, put our concept together and the first concept we took to Griff, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, our thinking was to use a lot more, um, less common, more bespoke materials. So we were looking at using Rammed recycled builder's rubble for our mass walls. Mm -hmm. uh, we were going to use a lot more salvaged timber in the construction. Uh, when we got that costed, it was about three times the price that we could afford uh, and, and, and greatly limited the builders who would be available uh, to us to build. So it was really price that drove us towards um, using volume materials. And then speaking with Griff again, uh, realizing that's probably the biggest opportunity for us to influence change in the, in the volume industry where most of the homes are being built. So working with eTool, we looked at various scenarios of walling. Um, the reason that we chose, for example, a double brick wall um, just for the internal walls mainly and, and, and a couple of those framing walls uh, was because we wanted the mass. Where we didn't need brick and timber frame was fine, but still giving us the performance we needed, that's why we used timber frame walling on the south. So that did cost us a little bit more. Surprisingly for some people over east, uh, the cheapest way to build uh, in Perth, at least up until the recent housing boom now, where brick layers are, are um, uh, hard to come by and prices have gone right up. But typically in a stable market, um, double brick's the cheapest way to build here in Perth. So it did cost us a little bit more going for what ended up being three wall types, double brick, reverse brick veneer and timber frame. Um, but uh, we decided to do that because we wanted to uh, reduce the embodied energy in materials where we didn't need it. Yeah. Uh, we were very mindful of understanding um, toxicity, obviously, and any ethical issues with materials that we were sourcing. So we, we ran the comb pretty thoroughly over that. Um, when ETOL did the life cycle analysis, um, they uh, demonstrated in their modelling um, based on the anticipated um, lifespan or design life of the home, uh, and even at the earlier PV system that it would be uh, a, a carbon neutral home over its lifespan. Um, mm. So, you know, LCA modelling, um, there's a lot of assumptions in it. Uh, they're a fantastic outfit at tool and, and, and I think they did a great job. Uh, so overall, we're, we're comfortable um, with, with what we chose to build. Um, I, I would like to see, certainly moving forward, a lot more emphasis on reducing the embodied energy materials. So I think as, as homes do become more efficient, because we're seeing um, you know, energy use go down through improved efficiency of appliances has been, you know, pretty normal now. We're also seeing the greater penetration of solar. What we're seeing is a shift in the importance of carbon reduction in the embodied energy um, component over operational. So when we did the modelling, as was the, the case up until fairly recently, it was about 70% of the carbon was in operation and 30% in, um, uh, in embedded in the materials, uh, including all the transport and decommissioning and so forth. But the more recent work we've done with some other work is suggesting even in volume homes, it's more around 50-50 now because of the, the yeah. changing um, energy mix uh, and, and efficiency. So it's a really important topic and one that needs to be, uh, you know, continually pushed. Yeah, fabulous. <clears throat> Thanks, Josh. Well, I should say, I should say, so just on that, 
Um, yeah. As part of the transparency of the project, we've actually the uh, eTool assessments uh, on our website. So if you go to the, that Josh's house link that I sent you and go to the um, about the project, uh, there's um, uh, all of the uh, assessments and certification reports, including the NetHead certificates, uh, the uh, LCA reports by eTool, um, uh, as well as we used another bespoke tool uh, that a colleague, colleague of mine um, developed called Arc Active, which was about mm -hmm. understanding a broader sustainability decision-making when choosing a property, particularly around location and and place and connectivity and all of those offsite factors. So um, that's there as well for those who are interested. That sounds really interesting. Thanks, Josh. Um, in terms of house and, um, and materials, there's a question around insulation. Um, what exactly um, was the insulation material that you used? You may yeah. have mentioned it already, but if you'd like to reflect that. Yeah, sure. And, so and it's a two part question. And okay. also were, were the pelmets involved in that rating? Yes. Okay. So the um, insulation that was used, so the bulk insulation that was used uh, for both the ceiling and the walls was a uh, glass fibre uh, bat, um, uh, Bradford, like a pretty, pretty standard uh, product, uh, R4.5 for the ceiling and uh, R2.5 for the walls. Um, in, the, uh, in the roof, we also had the Anticon uh, in the and the roof shooting, which you saw, and that has both a reflective as well as a bulk ins uh, insulation layer. Uh, and that helps take um, pressure off the uh, ceiling insulation by stabilizing the temperature in the cavity, but also helps with uh, condensation management, which is good. So I should say, we, we also had a, an attic storage built into the roof cavity, and that was a way of being able to reduce the storage requirements on the ground floor and making the homes a bit more compact. Uh, in the walls, we had the, the 2.5, um, uh, uh, glass bat uh, insulation, and then we had the closed cell reflective anticon. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you've got obviously the moisture membranes and the air that's between it. So I think all up we get a, about a 2.75 um, R value, but of course the bulk and the reflective insulation work a bit differently. So uh, all modeling suggests that that was the right choice for us. You know, we didn't want to over spec or end up with an overheated home, given the amount of glazing on the north, all those things. You know, it's not more is not necessarily best. Mm. Uh, and um, the uh, the curtains and um, and uh, pelvining systems um, uh, were factored into the model. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you. And um, in terms of um, the materials for your home, um, there's a few questions here about um, low or no VOC paint inside and indoor yeah. air quality. Can you speak yeah, sure. And what you did around that? Yeah, no, great question. So, as far as the indoor air quality is concerned, um, first thing we did was um, specify um, uh, low VOC uh, cabinetry, um, and so it's low VOC cabinetry um, through Laminex, uh, who um, spec that to a uh, um, GBCA Green Star standard. Uh, also, then low VOC paints. So we used. Um, uh, uh, Julux low VOC paints again that meet the uh, Green Star um, standard. These are all standard off the shelf products. So we did look at maybe using some um, uh, more, uh, I guess, um, you know, tailored you know, clay paints and other things, but they, they dramatically increase cost, not just in the product, but mainly the labor. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we, we chose for products that we, we knew would be delivered by our builder. Um, and, uh, and we were satisfied with the, with the uh, VOC um, certification standards that we use for those products. But perhaps most importantly, one of the things that we did initially is we used all our own old furniture. So we weren't then getting a new home that we bring in all these new couches and new beds and new foam mattresses. We, yeah. we, we, we used stuff that we already had. Um, and one of the most important things we do is that we make sure our home is really well naturally ventilated. Uh, so we open up, we get fresh air, uh, the home was designed to be a low allergen home, so there's no skirting boards, uh, there's no carpets, uh, it's all just that concrete uh, finish floor, so we can run a microfiber mop over it. Uh, and, uh, you know, that uh, when combined with using uh, basically uh, non toxic, safe cleaning products, uh, largely vinegar and bicarb, um, the home is a very healthy home to be in. One of the things we did do. 
for those who are enthusiastic, because there's not, I, I, I would hazard a guess, there's not much that we didn't look at, investigate, document, and share with this project, um, including the VOC aspect we, with the video series that we did, uh, and they're all available on the website. We looked at the indoor air quality um, angle and we actually brought in an environmental toxicologist who brought in a VOC meter. And we did all this live on camera and said, right, mm. we, we spoke through what we set out to do, the products we chose, how we designed it, what we wanted to achieve. And, and he went around and, and uh, after, I think it was only oh, less than two months of moving in, mm. um, the indoor air quality was um, pretty close to um, outside air quality in terms of VOC. So, yeah, we're pretty happy with that. Excellent. Oh, great to hear. Um, there's been quite a few questions about um, the chilly winter we've had in Perth this yeah. um, this time round, and um, has it performed as well this winter for you as you thought? Yeah, look, it has. We haven't really noticed, um, like you know. Again, I think it's the, the, the coldest it's got in the morning was um, like sixteen point two degrees or something like that. Mm. There is an enormous amount of um, of thermal inertia in that mass in the slab and the walls. Yeah. It takes a long time um, to really get cool. And whilst the, the, the temperature um, that I'm referring to there is, um, is air temperature at shoulder height from the, from the wall sensors. And in fact, the main one we use is on, a, on, a, on cabinetry. So the, the, the mass temperature is influencing the sensor. Yeah. We have sensors on all different walls within, within the open plan living area. Um, it gets to a point in that the mass doesn't allow it to get much cooler than that. Uh, which is which is really interesting. Um, for those who are interested, in fact, the, the real-time data is, is currently offline for maintenance. We're, we're having to um, uh, re-import the solar data, which comes from the Fronius uh, server. They've changed their API recently. But what we have done is we've got sensors that basically go from ground, in slab, um, at shoulder height, ceiling, um, cavity, roof surface, and outside. The slab, the slab temperatures barely move year-round. It's really interesting. You get a little bump in winter where they're getting direct sun on them, um, but then they pretty much stay stable um, all year round. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm glad we're getting warmer days. That The house wasn't warming up and getting to 22 and 24, but it, it was still, you know, getting up to about 20 most days, even in this coolest um, cold July. Yeah. yeah, delightful. So warm hands inside. Um, there's a couple of um, questions around size. So size of your block and height of your ceilings. Yeah, sure. Uh, so overall, the block is 1160 square metres. Uh, so that has the two homes and all those common areas uh, on it. Um, the verge is uh, 60 square metres. So I claim that, of course, I'm landscaping with that with a waterwise verge. So, so it's a good old fashioned quarter acre with the, with the verge now, which is great. Yep. Um, yes. But yeah, the, the rear block um, is about 500 square metres in terms of the effective building lot. And the, the front is about 420 odd. And then there's the driveways and shared space. So make up the balance. Um, the homes themselves are 160 square metres. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and how? inside how oh sorry uh 28 course high uh so uh if you count the bricks behind you on the screen it sounds really keen um but it's uh, no sorry sorry it's 31 course high 28 standard and we went to 31 um courses so uh a little bit higher than, than your standard to get that sense of height to make sure the sitting fans can go in to give us you know um again that feeling like you're not getting a haircut if you're tall yeah. Um, so uh, 31 course height ceiling, yeah, Great. which is nice. The the um, in line with the universal access objectives, we've gone for slightly oversized doorways, uh, mm. so um, nine, ten um, millimeter uh, front doorway, which is nice. Uh, 890 over 870, 890 over 840, I think it is for standard doorways. So, the slightly wider doors gives you this sense of. A bit more space. Um, that main hallway that you saw when I showed you the um, the solar tube down the end, uh, again, just slightly more generous in that hallway, just so there is that sense of not being. I mean, it's, it's 160 square meters is 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 not a big floor area for a standard home, certainly in Perth. In fact, most new homes around Australia. Um, but it's we've been very careful, and this is a lot of it was to Griff optimizing spaces. 
making sure that there's generous circulation spaces. It meets the uh, silver level standard for livable homes to ensure that there's good circulation in all the rooms. Um, you know, flush doorway, um, hobbler showers. Um, the main bathroom um, has been designed uh, so um, grab rails and so forth can easily be installed in case someone's there with an injury. These were simple things to design in and it makes the home a lot more robust. Also, that helps with the design life because people can age in place. And then, of course, that helps the LCA story as well. Yep, fabulous. Um, quick one around, we might shift to power now. There's quite a few questions around power. I can't believe there's no gardening questions. <laughs> I'm getting off easy. This is great. Normally I get smashed with those. So I'm actually quite... Do you have quite, any gardening questions? I'm quite pleased. The ABC You're welcome to throw <laughs> That's right. Um, See me tomorrow night on gardening this year. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a curious one around, um, what do you think like edged up your house from say a six to seven to a 10 star? What do you okay. think the difference might be there? Yeah. So um, there's actually a couple of things working together. So firstly, we made sure we had an ideal orientation really good solar gain. Uh, and then the use of mass have a really stable indoor temperature and then the right insulation. So it's not rocket science if you respond to the site well. Uh, and, you know, and it's, again, it's, um, it, it gets trickier with an awkward block or, you know, if you've got a building designer that puts things back to front, which some people do, because they, they just work on plan rather than responding to the site. Um, it was pretty easy uh, for, for Griff to get us to, um, eight and a half, nine star. And again, I keep crediting Griff because whilst we, we came to him with the, the basic floor plan, um, clearly I was familiar with the, with the core principles of plant responsive design. So we had all the basics in place, but what, what he really did was optimize the design to make sure that we had um, the spaces right. We're working with standard materials lengths, um, all of which helps drive costs down. Yeah. Um, and uh, and yeah, getting to kind of eight and a half, if nine star wasn't too hard. What got us to ten star was looking at the reverse brick veneer walling, uh, and perversely taking out one of the solar tubes. We had an additional solar tube down in the mm -hmm. open um, plan uh, living area to because it's quite a deep area over the kitchen bench. So because in in winter, um, you know, when the, the the days are shorter and the light angles low. Um, we don't get much backlight coming in. So we thought we'll put another solar tube in, but because it is the main, you know, living space, um, that solar tube is actually seen as a weakness in the in the insulation, um, even though in practice it wouldn't have made an inch of difference um, given given the mass in the home and, and, and all the rest of the, the aspects that we looked at. So, uh, but yeah, and, and going to the reverse brick veneer walling did add a bit of cost because um, it added that third walling system. And, you know, the, Builders aren't used to it. They've got to get two trainees to talk to another when it comes to walls. Someone had to lay bricks and someone had to come and uh, put a frame on it and pad it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So just to confirm, there's no additional heating in your home. It's just None. a solar passive design. Correct. Home, which produces the uh, heating. Correct. Yep. Uh, great. So on to um, energy. We've probably got about 12 minutes left when we said we'd finished and it is getting laid over east. Um, in terms of your PV, um, um, someone mentioned um, that your approach that um, someone said here around solar PV and batteries together. Um, do you who do you who do you see for that that combo? Yeah. If you've got solar ready, or if you're wanting to get a battery, what are the yes. good battery options? Can you share a little bit about that, including specific ones if you'd like, or brands, or what? Um, sure. I know that you were the first adopter and then you upgraded. Can yeah. you speak a bit about that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, look, it's a lot easier now than it was when we first looked at our um, original battery. That was that was hard work. Uh, there's now a number of batteries on the market. There's a number of good um, suppliers. Uh, I'm sure Renew has done um, uh, articles on, on, uh, on rating systems and suppliers and battery choices. Uh, so there's no shortage of material out there. And I, I do a plug and push towards Renew to start with. But what I would recommend is make sure you go through a good supplier. Um, and the way you know they're a good supplier is they won't just try and sell you something straight away. They'll actually understand uh, your load profile. Um, so that is, you know, how you use your home, what your energy demand is by time of day, um, understand your location clearly, um, the nature of your roof, any shading, all that kind of stuff, and can help you size something. So a little bit of extra work in, 
making sure you um, size the system correctly, uh, will be paid off in terms of how the system performs. Um, you know, it's a bit of a tricky one. People often say, should I put a battery in? And um, my personal approach is if you can afford one and you really want the satisfaction of reducing reliance on the grid and, and, and having a greater utilisation of your own energy source, then yes. Um, you know, in most cases, the business case that is, you know, payback within the warranty period is not quite there, depending again on your load profile. Um, perversely, the more energy efficient you are, the poorer the business case for payback. Um, so, you know, for, for some people who, who really um, can look at uh, increasing utilisation of their power and, um, and depending on their tariffs and where they are around the country, you know, the business case might be there, but normally it's pretty marginal or not. Um, batteries haven't come down as quickly as I think a lot of people thought they would in price. They are coming down for sure. Um, the expectation was that they'd come down in their trajectory as fast, if not faster than PV has, and that hasn't happened. What we're also beginning to see, of course, is other storage options coming onto the network uh, in community batteries, um, you know, mega batteries. Uh, and this is, this is great. And, and ideally, we should be utilising the grid a lot more. Uh, and we do have a grid in transition. It's not a smooth process, clearly. There's been zero political leadership in most of the country on it. Um, and it's been industry leading the push more than anything else. So, you know, it all comes down to the project and what your personal philosophy is. I mean, I'd much rather see storage integrated into the grid at various scales, touching all the sweet spots rather than everyone having to have their own battery because it's expensive and it's a lot of materials and they've got to de be dealt with after, you know, decommissioning and all the rest of it. We should be much smarter and use the grid that we've all funded through generations of tax dollars. Um, so, but it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a hot space and it's changing all the time. But, you know, at the end of the day, focus on efficiency first, um, you know, reduce unnecessary usage, uh, and, uh, you know, and then look at, at storage as the next level, either, you know, behind the meter or as, as part of a, a community battery, you know, grid scale solution. Yeah, nice one. Thanks, Josh. I think that's a really great summary. And um, some states do have um, support from their state governments giving... Yeah, the um, subsidies, you know, yeah. And, and I think we'll see more of that. That, that conversation is live in, in WA at the moment. Uh, you know, where we've seen nearly 30% uptake of rooftop PV in Perth um, I think it's just about leading the country, maybe just behind Queensland. And, you know, it's taken everyone by surprise, surprise rather, um, which is kind of weird because it shouldn't have. It's been a pretty clear trend for a while. But anyway, it's taken the regulators by surprise um, and the network operators. So they're now going, okay, well, maybe it's time to take away um, the uh, rebates for PVs because the business case is solid there now. It pays for itself mm -hmm. pretty quickly and put the rebates towards... Um, storage to help with grid stabilisation and, and, you know, increased utilisation of renewables. That'd be smart. Be smart, yeah. Um, great. Um, thanks for that, Josh. So in terms of water, um, I've got a question here around, someone's curious, how do you do that for yourself if you're not Josh Byrne with the research team and, and all of the, the modelling and data? How would you go about actually thinking about um, designing up your water um, response for your house? Sure. So, um, this is not intended to be a plug for my book, um, but uh, the book sets out the process. Uh, on top of that, uh, if you go to our website, I do um, provide all the schematics and all of the uh, details on what we did, but the book does tell the kind of story in a very conversational way of, of how to prioritise things and how to put it in, into place. So I hope that's, I hope that's useful. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, I mean, there's, there's some great tools out there too. Again, another plug to ATA and Renew is the Tankulator, uh, a great online tool for properly sizing a rainwater tank. I mean, most people just get a tank and stick it where it fits. That's not the way to go. Start sizing your battery. What's your demand? How are you using your water? Where's your location? What's your roof size? Guess what? Um, ATA or Renew um, Tankulator shows you how to size a tank so you can kind of optimise your infrastructure. Modelling's done for you through this online tool. So... I definitely recommend that. Uh, and, uh, and then, yeah, jump onto the online resources on, on our website or the book to, to help with some other guidance. That could be a whole, a whole online presentation in itself otherwise. <laughs> yep, <clears throat> absolutely. We can't go there. We've got another six minutes <laughs> left. Um, there's quite a few questions around, and my one at the beginning of the night was, 
now that you've designed, you've lived in the house for seven years, is there anything that you would now want to tweak? We've heard about the transition um, from electric, from gas yeah. to electric and, and seen the data on that. Yep. Is there anything else design-wise that you would like to tweak? Look, um, this is a bit of a boring response, but not really. Um, so certainly all electric is now the way to go. It, it wasn't the case when we first designed and had it built, but it became so, so we did it. Uh, but to, to anyone else thinking about, um, you know, building, I'd just say just, you know, consider all electric to start with. And certainly in other projects that we're doing, we work on quite large scale urban developments. Uh, we push those to be all electric, no reticulated gas. That's it. Um, other things around, you know, the, the home, it, look, it, it's, to be honest, it's not a particularly sophisticated design. Um, we intentionally did a very basic first principles design. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful design, don't get me wrong. And if Griff's listening, that's no, no criticism, Griff. And he would say himself, this, he, he, is, he has a formula based on, on, on building physics that works. Uh, and for that purpose, and, and I think there's a beauty in that. It's, it's quite a utilitarian approach to designing. Yes, there's little things like, would we put light switches in more practical places? Do they put too many power points in it? 300 bucks a pop as far as the builder price? Yes. You know, um, did I over network things? We put in a smart wiring system separate to all the building monitoring, um, which, you know, guess what? Wireless technology came in with, you know, Bluetooth stuff very, very quickly after. So all those little things, mm -hmm. but the actual the fabric of the home, the core design, um, no. I'm always tweaking stuff in the landscape, particularly plant selection, because I'm a plant nerd. Um, so I'm, I'm trying new things, and but, but the fundamentals, look, I put a lot of thought into it and I, and I did seek advice um, to bolster my own understanding of things. Uh, I'm never afraid of doing that. I'm a big fan of collaboration. And, and so I think we got all the basics absolutely right um, for that site in this climate and and we love living there so no it works for us I, I don't think I'd change anything major yeah fabulous thanks Josh it does sound like there's been a lot you put in mm. and like you say apart from those little tweaks um yeah it's really worked for you um in terms of um the home book that you can get and that the government's produced yeah um, your home yeah, yeah. Yeah, your home. Um, there's been a few comments around that. Um, you know, you've obviously got your book. Are there any other resources that you'd point people towards? Yeah, so firstly, um, the Your Home uh, manual is brilliant. Uh, and, uh, you know, my book was never intended to be a substitute for that. I would still recommend people go to Your Home and I know the next one's due out soon. There's been a major revision of it, which is great long time coming and, and kudos to the team behind that. Um, uh, I, I would still you know, point to that as the, the number one uh, resource. Uh, our book was, um, it was really about um, a, a, a personal story about how and what we did uh, and sharing that story uh, with a lot of good technical guidance, of course, and based, it, based on, um, on good principles and evidence-based approach, but, but it's, it's also full of beautiful pictures. It's designed to inspire. Um, but another good guide that's out there, so there's a lot of resources produced as part of the CRC for low carbon living, and they have a knowledge sharing hub, uh, which is called um, Built Better. Uh, so if you pop that in your search engine, it comes up and a series of guides were produced, low carbon guides. Um, I was the lead author on the um, low carbon guide to housing new builds. Uh, another research team were involved in the guide for renovation. Uh, that's very good for those and, and what's great about it is it shows different um, uh, age eras of housing and, and how to as in from you know older um, uh, homes through to you know kind of um, 50s and 60s type homes to, to, to the newer homes that haven't been built well in some cases so that's a really really good resource um, so really there, there's three and probably a, a pretty good start. Fabulous thank you so much um, look, I think we're really wrapping up now. So um, I'd just like to put a huge shout out to Josh for spending the time, taking the time to share um, the performance and design of his house with us, all of you. And I hope anyone that's been listening has got some really great links from Josh's house to Griff Morris's solid dwellings. I've put a shout out to him and I've put his website in the chat there. Um, we've also got the Your Home Guide. So if you're starting out um, or if you're wanting to sort of 
uh, look at monitoring your home as well. Um, there are some good links on how you can do that there. Uh, so thank you so much, Josh. We really appreciate the time that you've given and um, all the best um, for the next decade living in your home. Thank you so much. It's been uh, great chatting and, and a wonderful forum. So uh, well done and I hope you guys keep up the great work. Great. Thanks, everyone. And just to, um, to remind you, if you have any other questions, really specific questions, there was a lot in there we couldn't answer. Um, Renew does a, um, a speed data sustainability expert. They do them around the country and they also have specific advice for your project. So you can contact Renew directly if you have specific requests um, around um, expert advice that you'd like for the home you're building, living in or renovating. Um, otherwise, um, thank you so much and um, have a wonderful evening. All right, see you later. Thanks all.